for the little share that the Swiss Army knife with, you know, 50 million blades on it, none of which I know what they do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> They're too big to fit in a pocket. Well, you need to start cranking. You know, Swiss Army knives are always like government programs. You know, someone says, let's throw another fucking blade on this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, this is good, yeah. You know, by the time they're done, it's, you know, got can openers, screwdrivers, uh, car tune-ups, adjusters. Do they still have the screwdriver that got the spoon? You remember all that? The knife? You get pliers on them. Scissors? Pliers. What? Pliers, too. Pliers? Uh, the ratchet wrench? Jumper cables? Jumper cables. <laughs> <laughs> They've got the parts that enable you to do a grip for Jewish people. <laughs> what? Yeah, you know, you know, you want to one, one about about a brisk. I had a, I had a friend who was a rabbi, and, and that is really a good paying job for performing circumcision. He got a dollar an hour and all tips.
good holiday. <laughs> now, yesterday, we went into a lot of different things earlier today. Did anybody have questions that occurred to you during your later hours last night? If you did, I'll be glad to answer some of these this morning. But I don't need the answer. I will make one up. If you don't, we'll get right into the next section. No questions? Well, you know, my theory is that repetition is a very important factor in learning. So what we're going to do is repeat yesterday's seminar. Ask me pride. No, no, we're not going to do that. Because, first of all, Mark wouldn't understand this. And second of all, we're not going to tell him what we did yesterday. We're going to read all the film. So you can't see it. All those comments I made about Mark, keep them to yourself. Keep them up between us. He doesn't know. Matter of fact, he doesn't understand the words I'm using. They're not middle words, they're big words. So don't tell him. Now, what? Ten bucks? Saying, well, 
I haven't been able to convince people for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. People have been telling me I was crazy since I was 12, or 15, or 20, or since last week when I read Ayn Rand, or Mises. <laughs> That's okay. That's simply a statement of your skill level. I know people who were bad carpenters and turned out bad work. And once they got their skills up, they turned out better work. A second myth, and it's a, it's a major error I've got to say, is the myth that, I don't know how to explain it, it's like, you remember when you were in sports and they said, no pain, no gain? You remember that? Boy, is that a lie. It's an absolute lie. And exercise, the worst thing you can do is exercise to the point of pain, right? If you don't know that, you know it now. Easy does it's a good way of doing it. The fact of the matter is, when you know how to do it well, improvement is very easy. Change is very easy. Persuasion is very easy. The fact that it's hard for you in certain cases is simply a statement that your technology isn't sophisticated enough, your techniques aren't polished enough, and you haven't allowed yourself to try another way. Now, some of you will be puzzled by that, and you'll be puzzled until after lunch when you've woken up. But I think you'll find that the sleep learning technique will allow you to realize that. <laughs> will allow you to realize that you can change someone's mind very easily if you know how. And you can reach and motivate people if you know how. The better you are, the easier it is. The better you are, the faster it is. If you have doubts of that, look at friends of yours who are in sales. Anybody here in sales? Raise your hand. Those of you who are in sales, have you ever noticed how, in some cases, you just got boom, 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 and got the order? That was when you did it right. Did you have that occasion when you banged your head against the wall several times for an hour, and then did it some more, and then finally made the sale? That was a statement about how incompetently you handled that other sale. There's nothing wrong with handling stuff incompetently. We all do it from time to time. But the better you are at something, the easier it comes. Now those are obvious points. Okay, write it down. Thank you. <coughs> I knew you do that. Now, <coughs> let's talk. Let's talk about the parable of the hammer. I know what you're saying, boy, Michael, would you tell us another story? <laughs> I know that it was just coming to your lips just as I brought it up. You're saying, Michael, would you tell us another story? Did I, did I get that right? You're saying, Michael, would you tell us another story? If you've got it, I can see your mind working right now. The parable of the hammer, it's a really an old story. I, I haven't told this for years because it's really a secret. There are a number of groups like the Masons. This is one of their rites of initiation, the parable of the hammer. The Essenes, who are a group of uh, religious occultists associated with Jesus, also knew the parable of the hammer. The only reason I know it is I have a direct revelation from the great grandma. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Michael, you've got to tell the parable of the hammer. These people will never truly understand what political persuasion is about. Can you be healed? And I said, I can. Can you be fetched? I can. Can you be rolled over? Sometimes. <laughs> Depends. The parable of the hammer goes like this. There was once a simple man who lived in a simple village, and they weren't terribly sophisticated, very backward people. And he was wandering through the woods one day, and this was many, many years ago in a place far, far away. In the woods, he stumbled upon a hammer. Never seen such a thing. They didn't have a high level of technology. Fire was on their to do list. He found a hammer. And he looked at it and he said, boy, this would be useful. And like some people when they find something, he started playing with it, experimenting with it. He discovered it with a hammer. He could bash rocks, hit trees, do all kinds of things. And he took it back to his village where all the wise people looked at it and said, this is a useful tool. So naturally when people see something that's really good, everybody wants one. So everybody started making hammers. Some people said it. I can build a better hammer soon, build bigger hammers, longer hammers, heavier hammers. 
they could break bigger rocks and hit harder. Someone came up with an idea, you know, if we had something like a nail, we could put together homes. Very simple. So this fellow decided that a nail was a useful addition to a hammer. And he built some of the first nails in the village. They used these nails to put together cottages and homes. This went on for many, many years. These were not really bright people. But they did have a piece of technology that changed their life, from thatched roofs to pretty well put together homes. And so for a hundred years, these people had hammers and nails, and hammers and nails. Whenever they came on to a new project, someone said, what do we do? Let's take the hammer. We'll saw the wood with a hammer. <laughs> what about the tree? Let's knock the tree down with a hammer. You hit it long enough and hard enough, it'll fall down. Slowly but surely. Whenever they had a problem, they went back to this tool. Until one day, someone came in with something they had found in the woods. A saw. hit it against a rock, it didn't break a rock, so it was obviously useless. They smacked it against a tree several times, the tree didn't fall down, obviously useless. They tried to use it to hammer in nails, it didn't work, obviously useless. So they chucked it along the side. Later on, someone else stumbled into a screwdriver. It's a screwdriver, they didn't go to screw us. You couldn't knock down trees with it. You couldn't bust out big rocks and a little rock. And so they chucked it along the sun. And these people continued on with their little hammer and their little nail. And they never really reached a level of civilization. And there was a reason for that. And that was because that was the only tool they knew. And for years and years and years, people came to think about the hammer as the ultimate tool. But you know, I'll let you in on a secret. When the only tool you have is a hammer, everything starts looking like a nail. And that's obvious. <laughs> that's equally true in persuasion. When the only tool of persuasion you have is an argument, you get a bigger argument. You get a heavier argument. You get a harder with an argument. When the only tool you have is an argument, everything starts looking like an argument. When the only tool you have is a hammer, everything starts looking like a nail. Now you're saying to yourself, what does this have to do with persuasion? And you have to know that the wider your toolbox, the wider your array of technology and techniques and methods, the better the chance you'll build a better home, a better village, and a better free society. But if you only want to rely on one tool, A, everything will start looking like a nail. And B, more importantly, you'll find lots of ways to fail. And then instead of saying, this isn't useful for this purpose, you'll say, I knew tools were no damn good. People are too stupid to understand for you to flip. Let's talk about Semantics of persuasion. This is the part I always enjoy. In a book called The Second Sin, a fellow named Thomas Zaz has a quote. He says, In the jungle, the rule is kill or be killed. In politics, it's define or be defined. Write that down. In politics, <coughs> define or be defined. For example, would you rather be one of those grubby anarchists or a principled advocate of liberty? Define or be defined. Are you one of those people who's calling for irresponsibility and licentiousness? Or are you one of those people calling for liberty and responsibility? Define or be defined. I like what Thomas Zahn said, so I went a step further. And I said, words are weapons, words are tools. They are. You've heard a rose by any other name would be a sweet? Oh, really? 
I'll let you sit on the stick and try and get some of the pie at you. <laughs> you couldn't sell any of them. How many of you have seen the different fragrances for perfumes? I love these different fragrances. Midnight Madness. Allure. Touch me. I fondle. Really important names for these perfumes. They all sound so sensuous. You know, just talking to the lady at the counter. <laughs> Thoughts cross your mind, men, don't they? How about patterns for China? How many of you ever bought China or bought silverware? Have you ever looked at that? <laughs> All the different names. What, what are some of the different names that you see for them? Remember, remember the different names? What? Sheridan. What? Athena. Athena. Heritage. Heritage. Buy my knife. You know you don't buy that. The fact of the matter is they spend a lot of time and money using language to channel your perception. A fork. <laughs> I buy a fork, 50 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Would you buy the Allure collection? Oh, yes, I want the Allure collection. <laughs> a fork for 50 bucks? Sure. 
survivalist. Oh, survivalist. That's the right. worst kind. <laughs> right? That was one difference. Antisocial. Alright. Now, one phrase was isolationist. I never liked the term. I like the term non interventionist. Think about the difference between the two terms. Non interventionist basically says you don't meddle in other people's business. A non interventionist in family affairs is a mother in law who leaves. <laughs> An isolationist in family affairs is a mother in law who never shows. There's a case for isolationism in family affairs. If I were to describe the two positions, I would use the word non interventionism. We can go down the line in our political phrases, and we're going to do this in this section. And you're going to give me a hand. Let's look at a few phrases, and I know that some of the phrases are used up here at different points. I did a survey once at the University of Arizona. I did this back in 76. I don't know how good the information is anymore. You're going to have to find out for yourself. On different phrases to describe the market, one was laissez faire capitalism, the other was capitalism, the other was free enterprise, and the other was a free market. In the U.S., and it's different from country to country, and it's different from section of the country to section of the country, I'm going to let you know, language varies from part to country to part. Okay? Very important. You speak French in certain parts of Quebec to be understood, right? In the U.S., laissez-faire capitalism, to most people, what they remembered were sweatshops and robber barons. Oh, yeah, John D. Rockefeller, those bastards that broke up the unions. That was the attitude they took toward the phrase laissez-faire capitalism. Now keep in mind that objectively all these words refer to the same thing. Capitalism. <coughs> Do you know what sort of images they came up with? That's actually what people think we have today. Capitalism. In, in fact, that's what a lot of people thought. Some people thought when they heard the word capitalism, they just thought of workers being exploited or these big piggy capitalists with their feet on the desk smoking cigars. <coughs> right? With all the cancer information, I said, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> But they didn't feel that way. Free enterprise, very often, what they thought was, in the States, was what we have now. So, well, this is a free enterprise system. That's what President Reagan's for. He said to every speech, I'm for free enterprise, in matter of Texas. And I'm for free enterprise, and heavy military spending. And I'm for free enterprise. That's what we have now. God bless America. Probably up in Canada, if you ask the average person, what do you think they would call your system? <laughs> well, our crowd would say that. <laughs> our crowd would say that. What would a normal person say? No, no, they would, they would call it the free enterprise system. Yeah, yeah I think so. Like, oh, it makes, it makes the economy also. Yeah. No, it's very hard to recognize that, though. Right? Now, if you want to communicate, depending on how you want to communicate your ideas, I found free market had the most uh, uh, appeal so far as people, and had less emotional baggage. Like, when I talk about free enterprise in the USA, everybody goes, yeah, Ron Reagan. You go, are you not? They go, yep. <laughs> so I don't use the word free enterprise, because I don't want people to confuse me with Ron Reagan. First of all, I can't say, well, Nancy. <laughs> Second, I'm not old. Third, my hair doesn't stick up like that. There's no good reason to do that. So if I want to communicate with him, and I want to separate him, and I don't want to be confused, I use the word free market. Up here, I don't know what the right word is. Be used. There's life. <laughs> oh, a oh, miracle. Well, now you know what word's good up here. The Lord has come to light. Yes. How about description of your viewpoint? How many people have ever heard yourself referred to as being radical? Oh yeah. I, I give you. I give you a title. Right. You know, I, I, I give you a catalog. I've heard them all. I've been called a maverick, a troublemaker, a troubleshooter, a uh, radical, a dissident, a right wing radical. Uh, right wing of Genghis Khan. That, that, was, that, was, that was good. I admired your attempt to really define the radical there when they said right wing radical. Um, but I have been called some good things too free market, set advocate, and uh, laissez faire activist, and uh, tax, taxpayers' representative. So. Libertarian gorilla. I, I, I have to. <laughs> the phrase I like best with Mark is destroyer of all that's good. <laughs> that was a real attempt to be fair. Yeah. He actually got the Don Quixote windmill. Did he really? Come on, the windmill or Don Quixote? Uh, <laughs> Just a question. You hear the word radical. When you look in the paper, when you see the news, who do you see the words radical applied to? Left 
wingers. Left wingers. Picketers. Picketers. Yeah. And always socialists. Anarchists. Terrorists. Trotskyites. Trotskyites. If you if you want to communicate with people and you want to communicate in a in an effective way, you don't want yourself to be referred to as a radical. Now. You can say to yourself, no, no, the true meaning of the word radical is, it means fundamentalist, it's Latin for Greek, go to the root of. And people go, oh, so you're a Latin monster. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to communicate, you have to use language that effectively communicates. I would eliminate that word from my vocabulary. Or how about this, revolutionary. We used to refer to ourselves in the States. We are revolutionary advocates. Capitalism. You know, free market. <laughs> car bomb, but only socialized cars. <laughs> That's what the word revolutionary means to, to many, many people. When they think of the word revolutionary, they think Ayatollah Khomeini, car bombs, Northern Ireland, Irish Republican Army. They think of uh, the Mid East, where, where people are getting on the plane. I would like to be in the non good in section. <laughs> hijacking, non hijacking, that's <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there was me, you and me. I lecture 
but you lecture. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
in, in government, and you point out that this is not, in fact, a, a rude question, but a good question, that they should, we should question all political parties as to their true nature and their true intention, because all the other parties are attempting to control you, but they don't say so explicitly. So it's a, it's a, what he's doing is he should do to all of them, do a litmus test to all of them. Are they trying to control me? What is their ulterior motive? What do they have? And then, of course, this also gives Bob an opportunity to reiterate our position, which we want to give him greater expression of his life, greater opportunity to motivate and develop himself. Did he express the, the, the fact that fascism and communism are, are nearly two sides of the same? Oh, yeah. No, that, that's yeah. all in there. It's, and here's a plug. It's a good statement, and he does go into that. So. What a nice, thoughtful thing. <laughs> <laughs> Other language that we have to describe political spectrum. You might think words aren't really that important, but look. Uh, the fact of the matter is that language can make all the difference between being understood and being alienated. The difference between the right word and the almost right word, to quote Mark Twain, is the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. The difference between effectively presenting your position and ineffectively presenting your position, allowing yourself to be characterized. Because once people think of you as a revolutionary, as a radical, as a, an extremist, they've mentally dismissed you, haven't they? They don't have to consider you viewpoint, because you're just one of those people who wants to tear down everything that's good and decent. You're one of those people that's a threat to everything that's humane in our world, aren't you? Now, I want to... Are there any words that you have thrown at you, epithets, that you don't care for? You know, if, if you cross Hitler with Christian Dior, you get a fascist designer. <laughs> <laughs> that had nothing to do with the workshop, but fascist might be a, Let me give you an, an, an important technique. Under no circumstances, deny you anything. Never do I. I'm not a communist. I'm not a fascist. I'm not a crook. All I'm missing, right? Right? You never want to do that. Very often, someone says, if, for example, are you in any way affiliated with a Nazi? <coughs> you might say, you know, that's an important question. The answer is no. Nazis are dot, 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 dot. Nazis are people, it comes from the root word, national socialists. They're people who try and control the economy. It's usually based on uh, a hatred of certain minorities, scapegoating. So ask the liberals. <laughs> <laughs> scapegoating, and very often uh, an intent to militarize the society. What we advocate is a free society based on respect for individual rights and self-responsibility. Now, I want you, I want to tell you why you use that technique. That, that's not just a matter of semantics. Whenever somebody says it's just a matter of semantics, they're telling you it's really an issue of principle. Never let yourself, oh, it's just an issue of semantics. Well, let's get beyond semantics and talk about concepts now. The fact of the matter is semantics are very important. Language is very important because it's defined or defined. Words are weapons, words are tools. Never use the I am not a technique. Never, under any circumstances, I am not a Nazi. I am not a socialist. I am not a U.S. Labor Party. Why? Because every time they hear you say that phrase, they have to pay attention to what a Nazi is. I'm not a Nazi. Oh, I heard something about Nazis when Mark was talking. I heard something about Nazis when Bob was talking. And people are going to go, Connect. So you never want to use the negation. What you do is you say, Nazis are. You might do it like Ed Clark does. When he gets a question he doesn't like, <clears throat> people Nazis? No. That's a brief answer. Nazis are such and such, such and such, such and such. The Freedom Party advocates boom, boom, boom. But every time they deny it, they hear your word, the word, and your name in the same sentence, they connect it. The normal associational pattern of the mind. You don't want to give into that. You don't want to make the mistake. Yes. I might be premature in mentioning this at this point in the workshop, but you remember you're on no, no under, under no obligation to accept up other people's terms in a discussion. I mean, you, Absolutely. you when when the, when the camera or the microphone turns to you, that time is yours to use as you see fit, and you can actually address that question in a totally different manner without even using such words you can promote yourself which in effect answers the question while at the same time promoting what you want to say rather than even responding to their terminology absolutely very very often a very good technique when somebody asks you a question you say 
if I understand you correctly, you're wondering whether we have a key. And you can unpack it. Or, <coughs> you know, when I hear that, and you can do this, someone says, well, aren't you people advocating a revolutionary viewpoint? You know, when I think of the word revolutionary, I think of bomb throwers, I think of extremists, <coughs> I think of terrorists in the Mideast, and uh, the Irish Republican Army in Belfast, I think of bombs, I think of death, I think of destruction. What we advocate in the Freedom Party is a principled advocacy of freedom achieved through peaceful means, voting, thinking, and social education. Very reasonable, right? The language is important because you don't want to be defined in their mind. If they can define you in a way that they consider offensive, they don't even have to deal with you. Lyndon LaRouche, how many have been reading about his infiltration of the Democrat Party? Boy, that pleases me enormously. <laughs> I can't figure any group that deserves it more than the Democrat Party. They've tried to be all things to all men, and they finally got it. <laughs> you know, they got Ku Klux Klan in the South. They've got Jesse Jackson in the North. In the West, they've got the migrant workers. In the Northeast, they have the textile unionists. And now they've got the U.S. Labor Party with Lyndon LaRouche, who's called the queen of dope pusher. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I admit she shoved Andrew a couple times. <laughs> <laughs> It's not the same thing. But the fact of the matter is that when they think of the LaRouche people, all they have to say is, oh, he's a LaRoucheite. That's the end of the discussion. Or, oh, you're a Reaganite. Blue. Sounds like Krypton, doesn't it? You know, Reaganite. Sounds like kill Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> it's got potential. The fact of the matter is that when you use language, you use it well. It'll serve your ends. And if you allow yourself to be defined in an uncomplimentary, unflattering fashion, you lose. Because now they don't have to consider their viewpoint. Let me ask you these two questions. How open mindedly could you listen to someone who described himself as anti Semitic? Hi, I'm, a, I'm anti Semitic. I believe that Jews are inferior people. Let me explain my viewpoint to you. <laughs> Think about it a second. You'd immediately dismiss it, wouldn't you? Because you'd know it was irrational. If someone said to you, Hi, I'm a communist. Let me talk to you about it. Your immediate reaction would be, What are you complaining about? A couple more years to be there. You don't even have to consider it because you dismiss it mentally, haven't you? Isn't that a fact? A current phrase that's popular <clears throat> is this one about affirmative action. They, uh, they don't say we're discriminating against blacks. They say we're affirmative action for these people. Yeah. Oh, we'll have fun with that a little later. Well, that's just yeah. the other side doing a good marketing job on that. It's their exactly. ideas that we have yeah. to undo by a better marketing job. Absolutely. <laughs> now, what I'd like to do is take a brief break. It's Sunday morning. How about we take uh, five, six minutes? Everybody get stressed? What? Oh, I, I, is it all right to ask a little criticism? I don't mind it up there. Well, it's just something disturbing. You know, when you were talking about uh, your TV interview and then after the camera's off, you sort of like macho flash the interviewer. I, I've never had to do that. And you said, I, you said you might have done this. And I just want to, I've always been really, I've gotten along great with everybody in the media all across Ontario. I've never had to be anything but pleasant and gracious. And it would just scare me if I ever did something like that. It's because it would be so unnecessary. Absolutely right. And at this day, and at this point in my personal development, I wouldn't do that. But you got to remember, this is back in 1976, and I told you what I literally did. Did you ever have that urge to do it? Well, I indulged in the urge. I wouldn't recommend it. Okay. But you're correct. You're correct. You're correct. I'm not recommending that you go offend your local news people. <laughs> if you want to do it, please label yourself as NDP. <laughs> it's okay, then. Well, and they do do that. You see, uh, we, our experience shown that other parties, including the major ones, get just petulant if they don't get things just their way. And we take anything that comes to make the best of it. And we got a very good reputation that way because they always knew that we'd cooperate with them and, and go with the well, flow. And they, remember, even the news people don't know how it's always going to end up. So That's true. Let's take a brief break. Thank you.
distinguish yourself from the people who say, well, we want freedom from this group so we can oppress you. We want, <coughs> we want freedom for women. Well, excuse me, freedom for who? Who is it exactly you want to free up? You want to free up the individual. You want to make everyone free, each individual free to do as he or she wishes with his or her life, as he or she chooses. I hate saying all that stuff. Due to a one-year debate with a feminist, I could have said, guys need to be free, girls just cook. You <laughs> <laughs> happy? He asked me to say that. I would never say that. It was his idea. Um, I guess you're in favor of abolishing libel laws, aren't you? Yeah, no, that's not. <laughs> I, I, I think that that would probably be a step in the right direction in this particular case. Yes. I think it's I think it's vital to characterize groups. I don't like uh, I don't like name calling in the sense of I would tease you know you running with running with dog lackeys scum sucks of communism. You know, <laughs> that's not a, a word a phrase that I use in normal conversation. I just tease. There's a way of teasing. I'm just sort of having fun. I think it's bad to do that in the sense of epithets. You know, this is an irrational viewpoint. This is a you know this is a collectivist thug looter. <laughs> Viewpoint. Now, you may want to characterize this as, as an example. This very clearly is a socialist viewpoint. Let me explain why. You could refer to it as fascism as state socialism. You could refer to um, communism as socialism on speed. <laughs> That's something that will stick in someone's mind. I think it's valuable to conceptualize and identify what these people are advocating. And if you can do it in an effective manner, I, not in a political <coughs> manner, because I think it's important to have ideas discussed calmly, especially with irrational viewpoints you're dealing with, not in any way. When you're dealing, there are some groups out there like the Rubenshites of the U.S. Labor Party, like there are some nutso extremists, and if you discuss their viewpoint and you characterize it properly, you don't have to name call. Simply identifying will do a lot to do it. Yes. In uh, many experiences I've had, I found that being calm, but always, and this is a fundamental, always identifying your opponents as, as being advocates of, of irresponsibility or socialism. There are a lot of good words that are effective. Um, you will tend to jar them into being irrational and emotional and hot-headed, which will undermine their argument. It, it, knowing you're right should always be the cornerstone of your discussion, because they know that they're not. Underneath it all, they have insecurities about what they're advocating. And, and they will respond to it. Their weaknesses will come to the fore. If you keep identifying them, and do not relent. And yet, always do it in a polite manner, so that it's not a personal thing, but it's a necessary thing for me to illustrate to the audience that this is exactly where you stand. And they will jar, especially in a two-hour debate like you see with ours. They, both the opponents get very, very nervous and start getting completely hysterical after a while. They don't want you to name their position. Very often, you want to fluff over it. You know, you, you saw that in the debate between Rip Path and Peacock on the one hand, and Vickers and uh, what's the other fellow's name? Pat. Kaplan. I, I liked him in Welcome Back to It was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> you have a point, Yeah, the other thing, you mentioned it before, and it's universal here, too, is just uh, breaking down the elements. For example, if you happen to be debating with Anne and Clark, pointing out that the terms that they use are designed to confuse when they say this, they're just trying to confuse the issue of the <coughs> Rather than saying they are commies or they are irresponsible or whatever, if you break it down so that people understand it, they're at least on your side because you're explaining things in their terms. Absolutely. Now, there was a phrase that I, I you ever heard this? It's been a few years, so ever so often I forget the language. Ever so often you will be accused of advocating a license. You know, first thing, I don't want to license anybody. The government shouldn't involve themselves in the economy in that way. But that's usually not what they mean. They say, well, we have, you know, what we're calling for is liberty, not license. What you're calling for, you know, freedom party advocates, is license. Licentious is wrong. What you need to talk about is we're, call, we're calling for individual freedom and responsibility. You will be accountable for your freedom. If you make mistakes, you'll pay for them. No one else will. If you do things bad, people will speak ill of you, as they do with Mark. <laughs> no, people don't speak ill of Mark uh, when he's here. Well, the right people do. The right people do. And that, that's something I'd like to make as a supplement to your lecture is having the right enemies is often very helpful. Oh, absolutely. You know, you choose your enemies very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
send them non-invitations to dinner parties, you're my enemy and you can't come, and they'll speak ill of you at their dinner party, which is also filled with other people with non-invitations to yours. But it's very important to, to characterize, when they're talking about, sometimes they will characterize you, well, you want to legalize drugs, you want to legalize homosexuality, you want to legalize atheism, or worse yet, godless atheism. <laughs>
the, the punishment and abuse we inflict on others who are obligated to us, like our children, is, is, is that's the consequence they see of certain, certain kinds of freedom. And that's a delicate problem that has to be addressed. It's not something you can say, look at prohibition, because they're not thinking about that. They're usually thinking about their dad, who is an alcoholic. That's and right. they're thinking of the consequences they suffered because their father exercised a kind of freedom that they resent. And that's what they're asking when good, they say that question. Good, good point. It's addressing their concerns. Yeah, it becomes your personal freedom, a social problem. One, one smoker is a matter of Yeah. And nine hundred thousand smokers in the same thing. Thank you. Automobile pollution or any other thing with abortion and so on. The work is of it's not a dividing line, but it must be a group transition zone where you pass from the one to the other. There are answers, it's just that they have to be delicate and they have to be compassionate answers, not ones that sound like a philosophy tenure. Yeah. So I've met your father, let him die in the gutter. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this is not what you call compassion, it's sort of social Darwinism. <coughs> now, what I'd like to go to is uh, political cross dressing. Now, some of you have read the article, and those of you who haven't, won't understand the thing we're talking about. It will serve you right, and it's all your fault. You will not be excused, but the test will go on. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about political cross-dressing. Let me give you a brief introduction to those of you who haven't read the article, which you should have read. If you haven't read it, I'll take $5 penalty fee. What? Pretty <laughs> persuasive. <laughs> <laughs> well. I remember in 1976 watching Roger McBride being asked a question. Roger McBride was a Libertarian Party candidate for president. He's also a producer of Little House on the Prairie. So we wanted to put him on Little House in the Potomac to make perfect sense. <laughs> he had the money. He could he had a, a young gentleman stand up in the back of the room and say to him, you, uh, you people, I was like, you people, you people, because you know you're going to be hit. You people uh, call for freedom, but uh, what's, what about these handguns that you're going to legalize? You know, you're going to allow guns out there that are going to kill people. And that's totally wrong, and I have to separate my path from yours there. What do you have to say about cheap Saturday Night Specials? Roger looked at him and said, you know, laws that forbid inexpensive handguns to blacks and other minorities, to women and people who can't afford expensive handguns, are the most racist, sexist laws I can think of. How can you support a proposal such as that? And he saw the eye fellow's eyes get sort of large, little orphan any eyes, and he sort of sat down. Roger changed the issue from one of guns to one of racial discrimination and sexual discrimination by pointing out one impact of the law that they were recommending. I remember talking to the NAACP, that's the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. It's been a black active organization for many, many years. And one of the people there and myself were debating affirmative action. Or was it forced busing? It was one of those. <coughs> it was forced busing. That was before affirmative action. Affirmative was a little later. We were debating forced busing, right? They wanted to take black kids from one neighborhood and, and forcibly put them into a white school. And they want to take white kids and forcibly place them in a black neighborhood school as a way of integrating the racism and promoting racial harmony. <laughs> I, I guess it was good for the bus drivers. It gave them work. <laughs> and we had a black dog stand up and say, we've got to integrate. We've got to end this racial discrimination. And he went on for, Lord, must have been 20 minutes. And I must have been one of three uh, non-black members of the audience. And it was not an easy position. I felt somewhat surrounded. <laughs> and uh, I thought it would be a good idea to present this in a very elegant fashion and then get the hell out. <laughs> <laughs> so I did the same thing as Roger did, and I did it in a different way. You know, when you tell black children they can't go to their neighborhood schools that are within walking distance of their family and their loved ones, 
Like George Wallace, you're standing at the doorstep and saying, I'm sorry, you can't enter because you're black. How can you support racism of this order? I sat down with afraid. <laughs> in fact, in fact, they were racially discriminating against kids in their own neighborhoods. You can't go here because you're black. And there are too many blacks here. We know because we looked at your skin. Too many of you. We sent into a white school where we keep control. That's a reverse black. We'll go to that in a moment. But the fact of the matter was, I converted it from an issue of this is affirmative action. We're trying to the bus to integrate schools to your whole proposal is racist. It forbids children to go to their local neighborhood schools on the basis of the color of their skin. And that's evil. And that's racist. And that's exactly what Dr. Martin Luther King was trying to put it into. And that's what I'm going to put it into if I can have sat, sat down. <clears throat> and I had two or three families come up to me that have been sitting there. And it was, it was sort of, it was strange because I had one of the mothers come up to me and say, you know, I'm glad you said that. I can't say that in my neighborhood because I get a lot of heat from the liberals. And I believe that. I want my children to be able to go to their school. And I'm sorry that they're being prevented from doing that because they're black. Thanks. It was on everybody's mind anyway. What did I do, though? I converted it from an issue of, we've got to achieve racial harmony to your discriminating against blacks. This technique is called political cross-dressing. Now, cross-dressing refers to members of one sex dressing up like the others. Right? Political cross-dressing is a way of taking your ideas and communicating them in the garb of the other person's particular, uh, particular language. As an example, in the U.S., we tend to have liberals and we have conservatives. Up here you've got right-wing socialists and left-wing socialists. <laughs> is that a pretty fair description of the political spectrum? Yeah. I don't really want to oversimplify, but if I got it down, <coughs> well, in Massachusetts, they got two kinds of political viewpoints. Welfare status who believe in civil liberties and welfare status who don't. That's true. I'm not making that up. That's true. In terms of left-wingers and right-wingers in the states, the liberals are the people who tend to be for the poor, the elderly, the indigent. They tend to be for the weak, the helpless, the voiceless, who they are going to help. They tend to be very concerned with social issues, primarily social engineering, socialism. The right-wingers, on the other hand, talk a good game about free enterprise unless it's their company getting government bailouts. They make a special exception for reasons of national security. So, of course, they're not doing it for themselves, it's for the country. Or as Lee Icoke would say, I'm glad they held alone <laughs> They tend to be free market, and they tend to be very concerned about almost a military austerity. They, they want to make sure that the streets are clean, and if they have to shoot a few innocent people to do it, tough. They want to make sure there's law and order, they make the law and they enforce the order. If I want to communicate with either of those viewpoints, I have to communicate in terms of their goals and their ideals. You can do it group by group by group. Now, the most important question you can ask when you're communicating to a political group is, why do they form the group? What are they intending to achieve? Now, you're not talking about their programs. You're talking about what is the intent of their program? Why do people join the environmentalist movement? Why? What's their motive? To get a better environment. They want a clean environment. They want rivers that you can't walk across <laughs> that don't catch fire. That's not unreasonable. You know, you don't want to watch Bambi walk out to the river, take one lap of water and go. It's really heartless. Why did women join the feminist movement?
yeah. just jammed it right down. They were tracked into programs that allowed them to be secretaries, waitresses, and nurses, but never doctors, and never business people. What were they really concerned about? They were concerned about an equal opportunity for women. That was a desirable goal. They were concerned with dignity for women. That is a desirable goal. And you have to separate the goals from the programs. Right? Very important to understand the intent of your group. It, it, I think, kind of quick, you can zero in on their idealism. You find out what their idealism is. Exactly. you got to keep in mind that whenever somebody's recommending a program, they're, they're recommending it to achieve a specific goal. It's a means whereby. When somebody says, I'm for welfare, they're not for welfare, they're for helping the poor. That's what they want to do, is help the poor. Right? They want to get reelected too. We're, we're not dealing with this, the, the, the political end. Well, we'll, uh, we'll skip the motives for the people supporting this for a moment. We'll talk about the goals of each group. When you talk to the group uh, who is for socialized medicine, what is the goal? To help them equal access to health care. They want health care for people. If you, their legitimate goal in there is, is good health care. That's a good goal, isn't it? Now skip their program. Their program sucks. You know, that's like that's like bleeding and leeches. You know, that's medieval. It's awful. But their goal is a reasonable goal. Welfare. The goal is not to you know keep some college graduates in you know white collar jobs. The real goal is to help the poor. How about unemployment insurance? What's the goal there? To prevent uh, unnecessary hardship on families and uh, people who are trained in a certain skill and can't adapt to it. You know, instantly. And this allows them a tiding over period before they get their next job. That's the goal. That's true. Is that an unreasonable goal? Wouldn't you like to have that for your family? Now separate the goal from the program. It's very important to separate the goal from the program. When people got involved with socialism, originally, do you know why socialism arose? <coughs> what were the goals of socialism originally? They wanted better working conditions. Better working conditions in the factories. Mm, that, that was a means whereby. Why would you want to distribute wealth equally? What was the, what's the purpose of distributing wealth? Everybody wants a piece of the pot. Eliminate poverty. Yeah. All right, eliminate poverty, yeah. Equality and fraternity. Equality and fraternity. Those are, yes. Well, largely, too, people were in the perception that governments were controlled by <coughs> large government corporations like railroads and things like that, and they wanted to break up the, you know, excessive influence on government. All right. Now, here's what you do when you're communicating ideas you do political process. And what you do is you look at the goals of the group. Very important to focus on the goals of the group. What you need to be thinking up are free market solutions to these legitimate goals. People having a piece of the pie, that's a legitimate goal. What would be a free market solution? More pie. Right? Right. And we could come up with a number of different ways of achieving that. Environmentalism. We want to find market ways of making sure we have a clean environment, right? Those are legitimate goals. I don't want to live in a, in a city where I look up and can't see the sun. Do you? I'm talking about non-rainy days. We're talking about real pollution. Now, what you want to do when you're communicating the ideas using this technique is identify the goals of the group. Then what I want you to do is, is what I call smuggling. Smuggling is where you take illicit goods across the border. What you're going to do is you're going to use the language of the group you're talking to. Remember how we're talking about different languages? You're talking body language. You're using the same sensory system when you're dealing with somebody with a visual, auditory, or kinesthetic. What I want you to use is the language of feminism. What would it, let's say we're talking about feminists. This is something Mark likes to do. <laughs> First, I think it's a clever way for him to meet women. I wouldn't bring this up because there's a woman here who's going to kill him later. Personally, I want to watch. It's a wonderful way to meet the girls, right, Mark? <laughs> I've never thought of them as that, but I guess. <laughs> Uh, they, 
language all their own. That's, uh, it, it depends on how far to the, to the weird side your feminists are going. You, no, it, it's true. You will find a spectrum, and the people you're probably talking to are as far as the spectrum. I, I should clarify, those are the, I'm talking to their representatives, and of course they tend to be the most militant and the most sophisticated language-wise. I would say if we're talking to a woman who wants to see a society where opportunity is encouraged, mm -hmm. then they might use a few things like sexism and, and, and uh, patriarchal. They wouldn't use such extreme terms, perhaps. You're right. All right. Now, if you want to communicate to someone, not the, I'm not talking about the, 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 the fringe, you know, the people who are living on these particular What you want to do is you want to use the language of feminism when you're communicating with feminists. So then they say, if you're in France, you speak French. If you're in Germany, you speak German. If you're in Holland, you speak German at certain times of the year. <laughs> in France, you speak German in 1942. <laughs> now, what you want to do is you want to look at the goals of the group that you're talking to. You want to use the language of the group you're talking to. And you want to use their language to describe your solutions to their problems. That's all political cross-dressing really is. That's all that it is. It makes a simple way of basically saying, here is a free market solution to your problem. Now, if you just say it that way, they go, that's interesting. Right? But well, you're not talking their language. Words, they have an initial resentment to a free market concept to their problem, so you have to go a little further. Exactly. That's exactly the reason why you need to use the language of people you're talking to. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking to feminists on the one hand or environmentalists on the other. If we were talking to environmentalists, what language would we be using? What kind of words would we hear? Clean. Clean. Pollution. Pollution. Corporate responsibility. They're very interested in making people responsible. Corporate responsibility. Okay. Liability. Liability. What other words would we hear? You Acid rain. rain. Uh, it's always been a fun one. Are uh, the trees are dying. The trees? Peace. PCP? The eco Our children's heritage. Our children's heritage? What else would you hear from the environment? Wildlife. Wildlife. Soil erosion. Soil erosion. Preservation. Now, if we want to talk, if we want to talk, you know, have, how many of you have ever heard William F. Buckley talk about poverty? You ever heard him talk about poverty? He really doesn't like to sully his tongue with words about poverty. When you have, hear him talking about the poor or blacks, you listen to him and you say to yourself, he doesn't care. It comes through like a glaring light. Or, or how would he know? I think that poverty is something that most people don't allow themselves to associate with. Them. <laughs> but if you have to associate yourself with that, I would say that only in the case of your maid should you allow it to enter your home. <laughs> He can talk about poverty all he wants and about helping the poor, and you don't believe it because it comes across as insincere. You know he really doesn't care, don't you? I really care about a clean environment. I care about it. I want to have a nice environment. That's important to me. I want an environment where my cats or somebody else's dog doesn't die because they've eaten something covered with DDT. I want clean rivers. I like lakes. I think they're fun. You know, I want to be able to breathe the air and, and, and go out in the forest. You know, I, I like that. That's nice. If I want to communicate with someone who is really concerned about the environment, do I have to use their terms? And I have to propose my solutions to their problems. Now, a lot of these works have been done. A lot of people have come out with <coughs> free market solutions to environmental problems. William Dolan in a book called Handstaff did that. A uh, fellow named uh, Smith, uh, Robert Smith, with the uh, Libertarian Party of the U.S., did uh, environmentalism, a libertarian solution. These, some of the work has been started. The point I want to make here is that what you have to do when you're talking to groups is A, use their language. I'm willing to concede their language. I'll talk their language. I don't mind being multilingual. Do you? It's a good thing to be. Because if you can meet them at their language, fine, we'll talk your language. That's okay. We'll talk about your goals. That's okay, too. Now let's look at another way of achieving them. And you do that by using their language. Take an example. You people don't seem to realize how endangered our environment is. You don't realize it's a polluted river put out by your factories. The air which has all this smoke spewed by unregulated industries is destroying our children's heritage. Does this sound a little familiar? 
If I were talking to them, I'd say, I'm concerned about the environment. I agree with it just like you do. I think businesses need to be liable, they need to be responsible. They have no business dumping their pollutants into your lungs. That's an issue of your life and your liberty. They have no business dumping poison on your lawn. That's an issue of your property. And that's evil. They have no business killing your children by putting things into the food chain. They need to be held accountable and liable. We need to have strict laws holding them responsible for any consequences that they dump on other people's lives. That's how we're trying to clean up the environment, is making the people responsible for it and forbidding them to dump toxic waste into your lungs, into your eyes, into your bloodstream. I'm not the enemy anymore. I'm talking about their problems. I'm addressing myself to the concerns of the environment also. Because they're really mine too, aren't they? And aren't they really ours too? Yes. Well, <clears throat> actually, I
trying out new solutions, and all they have to really do is reconsider their solution. That makes sense, doesn't it? Now, you can do that with everything from unemployment to feminism to racial harmony to creating jobs to freeing up the marketplace to any pollution. And when you do that, and that's asking you to take a responsibility. It means that you've got to know who the hell you're talking to. It means that you have to understand their concerns. Let me give you some advice if you don't understand their concerns. You ever met somebody and you're not really sure where they're coming from? You listen to their programs and you, your immediate reaction is, oh, shit, another socialist. Oh, darn, another status. And you immediately put them in the category. Try this. Good communication is 90% information gathering and 10% intervening and getting a new conclusion. Say to them, I'm curious. Tell me a little bit about your programs and ask them what they're trying to achieve. They'll say, well, we're for equal pay for equal work. Oh. That sounds reasonable to me. Would you also be for unequal pay for unequal work? And they go, well, I don't know. What are you going to I'm, I'm curious. I don't know a lot about your viewpoint. Could you educate me? When was the last time you had somebody ask for your opinion, ask you a lecture to them and straighten them out? People love it, don't they? The fact of the matter is, if you don't understand the viewpoint, ask them. You know, say, I'm really unsure you're in the Sierra Club. What is the Sierra Club's purpose? Why are you trying to do that? You sit down and you talk to them and you ask them. People will tell you. They'll tell you what their goals are. Don't listen for how they're going to change the world. Don't listen for their program. If they say, I'm for socialized medicine, I say, okay, socialized medicine. What do you want socialized medicine to accomplish? What in your mind is the reason for socialized medicine? And they'll start telling you the purpose of socialized medicine. What is that designed to accomplish? What is it designed to prevent? They will tell you. Now you can rebridge the gap between their goals and your solutions using their language. Does that make sense as a way of communicating? Because you've got to remember that people don't join movements, social movements, political movements, just to kill time. Usually, they're important commitments in their life. Let's take an example that we've been hearing about, drugs. Why are people really trying to banish drugs from our society? Why? Because excessive drug use is, is very detrimental to your health and the health of those around you. Okay. Why else? Why else are they trying to banish drugs? Crime-related or drug-related crimes. Crime-related crime drugs. Crime related. <laughs> I like that. That's both ways. Yeah. That's both ways. Yeah. You don't want your kids to have drugs either. Now, do these seem like reasonable goals? You don't want your kids to have a lot of drugs. I mean, other than aspirin and Ritalin during, during school to slow them down or something. <laughs> you don't want your children, you, you don't want drug-related crimes, you don't want someone to stick you up because they've got to support a heroin habit. These are legitimate concerns. We need to address them. And if we basically say, my solution is, legalize them and it will all be better, you can trust me. <laughs> <laughs> that is not called persuasion, that's called dumb. <laughs> the fact of the matter is you have to show them how your solution deal with the problems that they see, and those are legitimate problems. How many of you have kids? Do you want your children to have drugs? Think about it. Do you really want them to have drugs? Do you want them to die young and so better because they got tainted drugs? No! None of us do. Well then, why are you arguing for legalizing drugs? That's a very good question I'm glad you asked. I start right out by trashing the consequences. What do you do? You go right to their goals. I think it's terrible children dying of drug overdose. Easy access to tainted drugs. Terrible the number of people who are committing crimes in order to support a drug habit. One out of every ten cops on the tape that deal with narcotics. Boom. Alright, you can talk about legitimate concerns here. Now, do you see what you're doing immediately? You're jumping on their side. You're talking about their legitimate concerns. And then you're talking in their language, and then you're presenting your goal using their language. <coughs> Simple, obvious technique. That's right, write it down. That's what political cross-dressing is really all about. 
Now, when I first used it, it was a matter of showing economic reasons for social liberties and humane reasons for achieving economic goals. And those are very useful. When you're talking about freeing the market, I tend, I tend to use humanistic terms because I view the marketplace as a humane institution. Statism is an inhumane institution. Government is the ultimate inhumanity to other people. What I came to realize that it was part of a larger picture. The picture is what we're producing is free market, freedom-oriented solutions to legitimate problems. Because the whole reason they generated all these solutions, the whole reason people go to government is they view government as a big problem solver, don't they? You know, government is Tarzan. Someone's drowning in the river, the crocodiles are coming in. Tarzan. Just a minute. I'll get him. That's the way they view government. Government is a great <coughs> problem solver. Well, I got news for you. Government is the problem, not the solution. And the market is the solution, not the problem. But you have to show how the market could solve it and how you would move from there. And you need to do it in their language. Because if they don't hear you in their words, and if they don't hear you discussing their concerns, why should they care? If you're a teacher and you come to me with teacher's problems, and I say, I'm not interested in your problems. We're talking about this and this and this. And if you don't get what you want, that's just too bad. Why would that person give me the time of day? They'd be right not to. Because that's the reason they're talking to me, is because of their concern. You, you know, I was saying that you just made me think of something that often happens to do to people when they talk to others, is that someone will come to you with their concerns, and for some reason you start talking to them well, about something totally different, like you're you want to give them the ideas of freedom, but also they're coming to you about problems in the education system. Do you want to talk to them about, you know, legalizing, you know, handguns or something like that? And if you're trying to sell them a classroom, yeah, right, <laughs> sell them right, selling them a product they they're not interested in, whereas <clears throat> you have a great opportunity to give them a, uh, an idea for a product they are interested in. And oftentimes people don't don't want to say, well, let me deal with your problems. You know, a lot of people want to say, oh, I'll tell you what I think about things. And, they go on about making themselves feel good and not dealing with what the person they're talking to. This is my first salesman at the Freedom Store. Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, uh, excuse me, do you have anything for feminism? Let me show you gun control. Yeah. Oh, what a nice store! Fact of the matter is that uh, you do have to address your concerns. That's the reason people come to you. Why do people want to join the Freedom Party? Because they have those different concerns. Because they view this as a possible broad solution to it. Right? That's the reason that we're involved. Is because we view freedom as a way of enhancing our ability to solve problems. Makes good sense. Now, Well, if you're selling drugs, you know, if you're based handling drugs and non-criminal activity, how would the Freedom Party institute the free uh, marketing of drugs? Would everybody, would every store be able to sell drugs? Or I would, as, would as, as, as one example, as one example, you know that during Prohibition in the U.S., Every year, there were 10,000 liquor-caused deaths by tainted liquor. Now, I want you to remember the population of the U.S. at the time was 40 million people. That's one-sixth of what it is now. Figure 60,000 deaths caused by tainted alcohol, bathtub gin, no sanitary conditions, and bad things in it. Sold by bootleggers. That was the biggest shot in the arm for organized crime. What that was is a way of subsidizing Al Capone and his buddies. Making drugs illegal is a way of keeping Miami prosperous. <laughs> keeping the Bolivian Airlines flying every day and selling a lot of very fat cigarette boats. But the fact of the matter is this. Drugs today kill people primarily because they're tainted. You have a young daughter or a young son. He makes a mistake. He tries marijuana or he tries cocaine. He shouldn't. She shouldn't, but they're going to get it today in the schools. The fact of the matter is they're just as liable to get tainted crap with impurities in it that will kill them. Your child makes a mistake. Does he deserve death for it? No, he doesn't. Does she deserve death for it? No, she doesn't. So for a mistake, they get the death penalty. You're giving a shot in the arm to people who are wrong elements, people who are going to spend the money for other things that are evil. That's what keeping drugs illegal is going to do. 
by legalizing drugs and making people responsible for what they sell, the same way as liquor companies are responsible for selling, well, in the, in the U.S., obviously where you're talking about government control, but in the U.S., and, and potentially in Canada, the liquor companies, if they sell bad brew and someone buys of it, they are accountable. If you sell a bad over-the-counter drug in the U.S. from aspirin to Tylenol, you are accountable. And what is more, by eliminating the impurities in there and taking the high profits out of the drug sales, you eliminate kids need to push. Most of your drug-related crimes are caused by what? People who have to steal to support a habit. Eighty dollars a day. Eighty dollars a day. Do you know how much you have to steal to get eighty dollars a day? Eight hundred dollars a day. Because that's what you get for fenced goods. Ten cents on the buck. So for an eighty dollar a day habit, because it's illegal, you steal eight hundred dollars worth of stuff from innocent people's homes. For an eighty dollar a day habit, if you've got a market, do you know what that would cost you to produce that drug legally? Probably five dollars. Someone who made a mistake would make a mistake that wouldn't bankrupt them, that wouldn't push them into a life of crime. And I think that would be good. So these drugs would be available in the drugstore. These drugs would be available in any way the market would make and available, just as liquor would be available, or just as Tylenol would be available. And people would be responsible for whether or not they sold it. If you sell drugs to kids and the kids kill themselves, <laughs> I would think that they're going to take the same attitude they do if a bartender serves extra brew to someone who's drunk. Is that that person is part of the crime. You put somebody behind a wheel and you know they're drunk and you give them the extra booze, you tell me you didn't give them a loaded gun and say shoot somebody. But we want to allow beer in the supermarkets here. How is, how that's is exactly it? why you need to allow beer in the supermarkets here just as we do in the States. So people can pick up their beer and their milk at the same time. So the kids can get the milk. Father, can get ready for football. Support. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit, you know, it's not very funny. It's a serious. Uh, exactly. The reason it's problem. serious. It, you're right. And one of the reasons it is such a serious problem is because you've got government making it illegal. You've got thugs getting into business. You've got school kids who are using the drug, and it's so expensive they have to sell it to their friends by probably, taking the profits probably. out of drug pushing. Yeah. By taking the profits out of drug pushing, kids in school won't have to sell it. Have you noticed that there's very little of a market for pushing beer in school? Mm -hmm. yeah. think, now, think about that. That's legitimate. It's true. There's no market for pushing beer. Okay. Ever so often when you're 17, a couple of your pals will get it. But you don't have six-year-olds going, Coors. <laughs> <laughs> I've got glass. Man, this is really good stuff. Why? There's no money in it. There's no money in it. And what's more, they wouldn't have to steal to support a beer habit. Corrupts the police and the politicians, too. Of course too. it does. Too much money in it. Exactly. Now, I gave you an example of how I would handle that kind of question. Did you notice everything I talked about, the evil consequences of this or that program I talked about, the things that people didn't want to see? And I used the language of the people that I was talking to. And the good things about legalizing, I used their language talking to and talked about the positive consequences in the eyes of the person I'm talking to. You don't want your kids on drugs? Let's take the profit out of pushing drugs. Okay? You don't want your kids to die because they made a mistake? Let me tell you a secret. I'll tell you a secret. I have used heroin. I have used cocaine. I don't recommend it. I, I used cocaine for about a half a year. I tried heroin twice because I heard it was illegal and wrong. You've got to be really in pain to use heroin because it does nothing for you. It's like being on morphine if you've ever been in the hospital and they numb you out. I was in an argument with my father once about legalizing drugs. And he says, I think those bastards ought to go to prison and they ought to get the electric chair. My father didn't want to double jeopardy in the first prison. And then the <laughs> my father's a real even handed guy. But let me tell you something. I turned to my father and I said, Dad, I made a mistake. I used cocaine. It didn't hurt me long run. It's something that if anybody asked me, do I recommend it? I'd say no. It doesn't do good things for you. It doesn't do good things for you. What do you think of heroin? I said, you have to be really pain to use that stuff. It's got nothing going for it. I said, but I got a question. I used it, Dad. Would you kill me? I made a mistake. You're going to kill me for making a mistake. You've got a young girl who uses marijuana. Are you going to throw her in prison for making a mistake? A young boy who tries cocaine. Do you want him to die because he made a mistake? Don't you have a right to make mistakes and recover and go on? Don't you have friends who are recovered 
were alcoholics, and thank God they were on. That's part of communicating in terms of your audience. That's part of talking about concerns that affect them, and it's part of using the language. That's what political cross-dressing is about. Does it make sense? Does that seem like a good way to communicate? Can you see that as being more useful than using your rhetoric and say, if they won't reach out and understand my words to help them? Can you imagine? I have seen this happen so many times, it's embarrassing. I used to go down to Mexico when I was a young boy. I lived across the border in Del Rio, Texas. We used to go across the sea at Attica, you'd walk down there, you'd get a haircut for a dime. And back then, you know, witch cuts, right? Remember that? They're back. <laughs> go across the border, right? And you would always see these little old ladies who come from Nebraska. I don't know why from Nebraska. Maybe they were done husking corn and decided to go to Mexico. And they would be in a restaurant, and they would, the waiter would go up and say, Wait a see a senior victim. Go on a And the woman would go, Do I learn Espanol? Do you speak Spanish? And then he would ask them what they wanted because he didn't speak English. And, then, and he, one of the little old ladies would say, We would, if you talk slow in the wrong language, then it really catches on quick. We would like bread. No habla inglés. Red. Right? They don't get it the first time. Say it slower, a little louder. That's usually very effective technique. If you ever go to a foreign country, you'll see this. You'll see this. And the, the waiter goes, no habla inglés. Bread. You know, bread. And sooner or later, they'd have to bring over someone who's a translator to get what these little old ladies wanted. This is done in politics all the time. You know, free market. <laughs> free dog. You know, like they're having trouble with pronunciation. You know, okay to choose. <laughs> That's an exaggeration. And I know you'd never do it. No one here would ever do it. But maybe you have a friend who on an occasion might have done it. <coughs> communicate in Mexico you when you communicate in Quebec, choose. <laughs> when you communicate in politics, speak the language of the people you're speaking to and address their concerns because if you don't address them, they've got no reason to listen to you. And if you don't just speak their language, they've got no way to listen to you. And if you do both, you'll find that people will literally open their arms and listen to you. I have people tell me they, they have trouble communicating with socialists. I don't. I've converted my share, share of socialists. If those of you read Ayn Rand's autobiography or, uh, biography by Barbara Brandon, there's a story about this young Marxist. And Rand talks to him for a couple of minutes and says, I'm going to get you because you're rational. And she does. And Rand didn't even talk the other language. She just talked logic, which made perfect sense to this guy. If you talk their language, they'll hear you. And they have no reason to ignore you because you're showing their concerns, because you have compassion. And there's a reason for that. Think about it. The marketplace, the free market, choosing who you do business with, who you're friends with, who your neighbors are, showing respect for other people's decisions, not violating the rights of another, respecting the person and property of another human being, that's a compassionate, caring thing. And when your neighbor's a little down and out, they don't need welfare, all they need is a helping hand. And that's a normal, natural thing for humane people to do. I would assist somebody in a need, and I've done it before. Have anybody here lent money to a friend? Did you view it as welfare? Or did you view it as a gesture of friendship? Wouldn't you do that for a neighbor if you had a neighbor who's a little down? And if you knew you had somebody who needed a little help in hand, maybe you'd give, take up a hat. We did that. A friend of mine had a death in his family. We took up a hat. We didn't go to the government and say, could you cut us a check? People are humane if you allow them to be. But I'll tell you a secret. With as much money as the government takes from your wallet every day, it's awfully hard to be very humane with your money and assist people who need it and spend it in stores in your neighborhood. Because when you've only got 60 cents of every dollar you earn, or 50 cents on every dollar, I don't know what it is here, but it's awful to say it's, it's awfully hard to assist your friends and spend your money and be humane and compassionate as the marketplace should be. Let's take a brief break. What time is it?
So let me show you. Let's take about a five minute break. We'll come back, talk political judo, and then we'll take a lunch. Okay? <laughs>
government city where thousands and thousands of tax dollars are really distorting the market, but we can go into that at some other time. Now, we're talking about the language of the people, the concerns of the people, and providing our solutions. I mentioned that one good fact will slay 10,000 bad dragons of theories. Fact of the matter is, one of the responsibilities you have to persuade people is to provide free market solutions. I haven't talked in detail about solutions, and I don't need to for one very good reason. This is your responsibility because I am not a Canadian. I'm a carpet backer, I'm a wet backer, a snow backer, whatever the hell you call me. You know, I watch press work. Not in the US. Not in the Not in the Not in the Not in the Now this is legal, now customs gets it. Let's call it 5,000, just for the heck of it. 
an even number. Okay. Whatever it is. Let's call it five. I checked it out. Seven? It's almost $7,000 per student per year. Okay. Let's use that number. Let's use that number and let's say... Wait a minute. I don't want anarchy. I want order and compassion. Self-regulating marketplace. So now fuck with me. <laughs> okay. Now here's why. Here's what we're talking about when we're talking voluntary school. If you want your children to go to a religious school because that's your belief, a Catholic school, a bilingual school, a school for slow learners or fast learners, you have an opportunity to send them there. You know, I have a friend in Georgia who has a free market school. His name is Jim Clarkson. Jim Clarkson is as white as I am. He had a parent come in and look both ways because it's very unchic to be a bigot. Even in Georgia, this fellow said, <clears throat> I had a question, uh, Mr. Clarkson. Uh, do you accept colored children in your school? Jim looked at him and said, is their money green? <laughs> 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 you know, the wallet is colorblind. Cash is no enemies. That's right. Cash has got no enemies. Credit sometimes, yeah. <laughs> now, the fact of the matter is, if you have $5,000 out of your pocket or $7,000 out of your pocket to spend on a school that educated with computers, it doesn't take too many children to be able to set that up. If you've got a slow child, there are other people with slow children, there's a market for that. There are going to be teachers who want to teach children who are slow learners, who have learning difficulties. That can be a very rewarding job when you do it well, and a very bad job if you have trouble with it. <laughs> right? If you like uh, children who are gifted, children that are, that are bright, maybe you'd want your very bright child to go to a school with other bright children, so they don't have the peer pressure. Oh, Miss Know-it-all. You ever had any of you get that stuff if you were a smart kid in school? Yeah. Oh, Mr. Smarty Pants. Oh, straight A. Kiss up to the teacher, right? Right? right. right. Brown noser. Oh, straight A. You walk home and people push you down. Yeah. The fact of the matter is, can you imagine the kind of supportive atmosphere your children have that go to other, uh, with other children have similar interests? If you had a religious family and you wanted them to grow up in a Catholic school where the kids wear brown dresses to the girls, a nice little shirt and the boots. I don't know what color they were in the year, but it's basically where they're still brown. Right? What are the colors are? You want to do that. It's your money and you have it back and you can spend it at the school of your choice. Let's go further. We have drugs in government run public schools. We've got lots of drugs. Why? Because of those disruptive bright kids who are there? Because of the misfits that are there and don't want to be there? You don't throw them out of school. There's so many laws. How are you going to get them out? Nothing short of a court order. In many communities will do it. If you're at a private school, Mrs. Jones, your child is using drugs. We won't allow that. Either he quits it or he's going to have to leave. Now the parent takes responsibility, which is where it always belongs. Yeah. You want a school clean of drugs? You can get them out as long as it's voluntarily attended, voluntarily funded, and run by people who care. Yeah. The rather odd thing is there's a number of students in this city who are forced to take drugs called a Ritalin, too. Oh, uh, yeah. And, and I don't imagine private schools would incur, or independent schools, excuse me, would encourage such a thing, and that's say the state. Very few people unless their parents, you know, with children with this problem, would realize this, but they give them drugs to suppress their activity. I'll tell you a story about Ritalin. You'll like this. There's a story about Ritalin. Ritalin slows hyperactive kids down. You familiar with that? You know what it does to adults? It speeds them up. This is a true story. All right, if you've got hyperactive kids, why don't you give the Ritalin to the teacher if it's that innocent? Speed them up. Children to see films like Amadeus. 
I would want them to role model people like Einstein or Mozart, great world leaders, people who they could look up to and, and role model and determine that they could do something special with their life. I would want them to read challenging books rather than being bored, wouldn't you? Yeah. Everybody doesn't want that, though. And you get to choose what kind of school your children are in. How about teachers? Some teachers are really good with certain kinds of situations. They could gravitate toward the school that wanted those sorts of services. And what's more, good teachers would be bought up just like baseball players. Hey, I saw your contract. We like your work. We've seen the kind of work you've done with hyperactive children. Your contract is up in another year. We'd like you to come to our school. We'll give you four years. Lou Holtz got five years. You get four years. <laughs> and we'll pay you such and such. You want teachers to be paid with their work? Let the market determine it. I'll tell you what, I want my kids going to schools where they're the finest teachers who care the most about them. And the teachers who don't give a damn, let them teach religion. <laughs> exactly. This is one of the most interesting phenomena you ought to learn about poor people. And I want to bring this to your attention. I have been in many poor neighborhoods. Look, I damn near starved to death a couple times as a kid. My dad in the Air Force made like $500 a month. $500 a month in 1963. Four kids, a dog, a wife. That sucks. Right? You go into poor families. Do you know what you will find in poor homes, in most homes, the working poor? I'm talking working poor for a moment. You'll find a set of Encyclopedia Britannica. That's the only statement that parent can make. Maybe the parent isn't educated. Maybe they didn't go that far in school. But they're going to let their children know that education is important. Do you think poor parents don't care about their kids? That's what so many upwardly mobile, snobbish people think, is that poor people don't care. And that's not true. Poor people care as much as we do. Now, what about even more? Poor parents very often will forego a vacation, a trip, to get their kids a leg up on the economic ladder. But I'll go a step further. Since we've already got taxes, right, and they're not going to abolish those overnight, why not allow a tax credit for any organization, such as a corporation, who gives money to an educational institution. I don't have children. I will never have children because I have a vasectomy. i got three cats, and they're hard enough to raise. <laughs> I will never have children, but I help my nieces and nephews. Yeah, I, said I would willingly contribute. <laughs> I would willingly contribute money to assist poor children to get an education. Why? We all win. Because at some point, that literate poor person will come pay to see me do stand-up comedy. It's a bribe. It'll work. <laughs> I'm not sure of the school, but it was one of these really upper-class, ritzy schools that cost a lot to go to, and you got uh, children of vice presidents of companies and that going there. Mm -hmm. And what they found out, that the academic level dropped, and they had to, to give scholarships to poor kids who were bright to come in to drag the level up and drag the wealthy kids along with them. <laughs> do, you think, do you think that the government should put a special tax on guys like you that have had vasectomies? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. I do it as yes, you know, my way of preventing overcrowding in schools. Now, the, yes.
you know what I would do? I would do a reverse macho flash. You know the macho flash? You gotta read the article. It's in your little handout. I do a reverse macho flash, and I say, how dare you suggest people would have children and not care about them? That people would abandon their children, abuse their children, not care about their children's future. How dare you suggest that you know better than the parents who loved them, who cared for them, who compassionately wanted their every need handled? How dare you suggest they don't care? Who do you think you are? Now, I, I would do that because, because if the fact of the matter is anybody who suggests that parents don't care, most of them do. There are going to be some that don't. But the guy who stands up there and says, most parents don't care. Well, compared to what? The government cares? <laughs> yeah. Now, now, what I wanted to give this as an example, and I sort of drew some of this from you. I wanted to give this as an example of how the free market would assist in education. Did you see the benefits? The benefits are diversity in education, yeah. tailoring the educational needs to your children's needs, mm -hmm. elimination of drugs in school, bringing your children up with the values that your family holds dear. Aren't these wonderful things? This is not a perfect solution. I don't promise utopia. There is no heaven on earth. I mean, aside from Las Vegas, there is no heaven on earth. <laughs> And you, I like it. I'm not taking it. No. Oh, I do. This is a way. To, can you imagine communicating this to parents? A number of them really do care and do want new solutions. They can see this with their children. They care. They want it. This is a way of showing a free market solution. Just a few ideas. I didn't give you a comprehensive case for free market education, did I? No. Give you a few examples. But we have, it, we have that if anyone's interested. For this. Please, by all means, that's the kind of educational material that can assist you in presenting your ideas well. Now, I promised I would be done at noon so that we could take lunch. Okay, but here's what I want to do. I want to do a very quick thing that I call intellectual judo. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is called hallucinating sensory deprivation. For those of you missed yesterday, uh, I'll do it real quick. Okay, John Lilly, Tony Tank. Okay, next. Monitoring your sensory section. Rap four. Build next section. Political cross -cutting. Okay, we're up to today. <laughs> Did I do that too fast? Now. Do it again. Okay. Now that was. Now that was. Medium room. Intellectual judo, I like. Because, you know, Aikido or judo. <coughs> called the gentle art. And it's called the gentle art because you never meet force with force. Meeting force with force is really an unnecessary expenditure of energy. It, it can get your bones broken too. <laughs> One of the nice things about judo is you stand there innocently, smiling. This person says, I have a victim. What he doesn't know is that you have a secret. <coughs> that person thinks that his job is to punch you in the face. Uh, but that is not his true karmic intent. <laughs> his, his true position in the existence and order of things is to move past your body as you assist him and add some impetus to the arm. <laughs> because that is his true direction. And assist him in throwing his own body to the floor, which is what he truly wants it. <laughs> and he only been able to discern his motives. He gets up and says, thank you for letting me realize my true place in this kind of thing. <laughs> you can do this with arguments. You can do this with arguments. And here's how. It's called, you remember Bruce Lee in, in the movie Enter the Dragon? And the guy on the boat says to him, yeah. what's your style? I call it the art of fighting without a fighting. The art of fighting without fighting, how do you do that? It's not here. In the boat. Right? There's this little boat, right? Bruce lets the boat out, and this guy's just about drowning. <laughs> He's not going to fight it. The guy's drowning in the water. That's the order of fighting without fighting. <laughs> Never fought the guy. The guy's just about drowning on the way to the island. I thought it was fun. <clears throat> I believe that arguing without arguing would be very really useful. Here's what we do. There are simple steps. What you do is when someone attacks your argument, gives you an objection to your viewpoint, how about somebody quick, just so you don't think I'm, I'm doctoring the example, somebody give me an example. Give me an objection. To free market, to liberty. What do you do? It's like who's going to regulate the technology? Who's going to regulate? 
Alright, that's a question. I want you to, I want you to say something bad about it. I want to critique. Not Hi, about all those poor. poor. What I'm about the poor? Capital. Oh, all right, how about, now what about the poor? You, you want to turn that around. Does your system have no place for the poor? Right. Yeah, your system does. It's called ghettos. Mm. How about this? Now they're, they're saying, liberty, freedom has nothing for the poor. Alright? What you do first is you agree with them. Notice this? You're stepping into agreement with them. I agree. The poor need to be cared for. We need an end to poverty. What am I doing? I'm adding force to their fist. What you do is you add excess baggage. You fill up their argument. They're going to give you just a word objection, or maybe a couple sentences. Make their objection even bigger. Balloon it up. Add that extra force. Okay? You don't care about the poor. I agree. Any system that wouldn't care about the poor is certainly evil. A system that would allow the poor to die in the gutters or the ghettos should certainly be appalling to any decent human being. Good guy's a little ahead of me, but <laughs> he read the, the right direction. He read the script. He read the script? <laughs> <laughs> Rewrite! Uh, I agree. Any system that doesn't care for the poor is an inhumane system. Any system that consigns people to poverty is wrong and evil. By preventing the poor from getting jobs and preventing the poor from moving upward and getting a good education, as the free market will, your system allows the poor to stay poor and requires them to be poor and doesn't allow them to get their first hand on an economic ladder. Now at this point, that person who's on the offensive realizes he's on the floor. What have I done? I said, yes, anything that hurts the poor is bad. Yes, a system that doesn't consider that is wrong. I've added, you're ballooning his argument. I've added some facts to it, show why it's, why it's wrong to have things, bad things happen to the poor. Then, as he's moving past me, I say, and that's what your system is causing. You want to show how their objection, in fact, in fact, is an indictment of their system. And almost every objection you'll hear to freedom, in fact, was caused by government or exacerbated by government. That's made worse. Not everybody knows what exacerbation is. No, that's not what you think. <laughs> <laughs> no, your eyesight will come back later. <laughs> you can do this. You can use this. Now, it's a simple technique. You agree with some aspect of their objection. You don't agree with the whole objection. Freedom hurts the poor, might be the objection. What you do is take part of the objection, the poor part. You don't agree with all of it. Yes, freedom hurts the poor, that's why I'm for freedom. <laughs> that is not defense. That's called suicide. You take part of their objection, the part that talks about the goal. <coughs> I agree, any system that wouldn't assist the poor, wouldn't allow the poor to get ahead, is certainly an evil system. You understand that? Does that make sense? Am I missing anything? Okay. We can do this with pollution. I want you to, one by one, give me different objections to freedom. If you don't, if you have freedom, this is a distortion, of course, you don't regulate uh, polluters and you have just random pollution. All right, now, how would I use intellectual judo? I would say pollution is an evil thing. Any system that would create pollution and cause people to die or be poisoned, have their lungs infected, create carcinogens, or release toxic waste or nuclear waste into their neighborhoods, into their homes, or into their families is an evil system. What have I done? I've added extra force to the argument. Which part of it? The part where I'm talking about the legitimate concern. I add that to it. In fact, the present system, by allowing companies to escape liability, to escape responsibility, contributes to putting this waste in our system. Good. That's why I'm for liberty. And then you give a brief statement as to how it would assist. In a free society, you would be accountable. If you have waste, you have to dispose of it. You can't dump it on some unwilling, unwitting human being, an innocent victim. You can't dump it into their lungs. You can't dump it onto their lawn. And you certainly don't dump it into their children's lunches. Or build schools on chemical dumps. Absolutely. Now, technique, very simple. You see it? You find their legitimate objection there. The bad thing that they're really critiquing, whether it's 
You people advocating freedom are against women. <laughs> I, you never heard this, have you? Yes, he has. Now, I agree. Any system that denigrates or desecrates women is evil. What have I done? I've, I've taken a legitimate objection. I've added it. I've ballooned it. I've added some extra weight to it. That's what the force is. Then I connect that to their system. I show how, in fact, it was their system where the system they're stuck with. It may not, they may not be advocating, but the system that we're in now that caused it. Then I would give a brief explanation. In a free society, without laws preventing women from getting jobs, without laws shoving women into stupid jobs or dead-end jobs, women would have an opportunity to rise as far or as fast as they want. The nice thing about the free market is this. Talent is always rewarded when it's seen. You'd be a fool if you're a businessman and you let a talented woman pass you by because she's a woman. Because if you don't hire her, you're someone will, a competitor will. Yes? So far I see it essentially very similar to the cross question you were saying. Mm -hmm. You take your objection and then you agree with the goals and then you present the free market. So how would, what are the differences between the intellectual judo and the cross question? Judo is just one move, basically. Your basic, it's, it's a very brief encounter. When they list an objection, I'm not trying to sell my whole viewpoint to them. All I'm trying to do is give them a package, a brief package. Like a judo throw isn't intended to win the encounter. It's just designed to get you in a position where now you can address their real needs, such as shooting them. <laughs> I don't know, it might be bigger than me, I don't know. What you would do is, one specific objection, you add weight to the objection, the legitimate problem that they're bringing up, whether it's pollution, whether it's women's rights, whether it's children, whether it's kitty porn. I'm really worried about kitty porn. <coughs> Me too. Any system that allows children to be exploited, abused, ruined, psychologically damaged is evil. Boom, what have I done? I've encapsulated the problem, I've acknowledged this problem, I've added to it, added to the momentum. Then I move on to how this system contributed to that problem. Then I offer a brief two sentences. In a free society, you'd be responsible for what you said and accountable. If you violate the rights of someone under the age of 13, someone not of the age of reason, clearly you would go to jail and no get out of jail free card. So essentially, how does it differ though from processing? That seemed to be the same thing. You can add a similar yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a brief one move technique. Cross-dressing, you can address the whole spectrum of oh. their concerns. This is just addressing one specific objection. How, but, would you, question. how would you catch the person? Are you talking about people who are selling this stuff or people who are producing it? Producing or both? Oh, pornography? Yeah. Oh, boy, that's, that's a mouthful. We'll have to get that uh, sometime during break. Uh, I was going to propose that. Okay. Right. If, if we could. Now, um, we will come back to that as, as we did with the drugs. Someone else's body. That's a rights issue. So you're right. 
95, 97, 98 percent of the laws we're going to abolish, but they're going to be somewhere where we're actually going to toughen the laws. They're going to be far harsher in a freer society. This one problem. A lot of the people who are polluting our beautiful trees and lakes don't live here. Absolutely. You're gonna, they you are. are absolutely. Those people in Wisconsin, I never liked them. <laughs>
Thank you. But by all means, those are always uh, things that require a little more discussion than most and aren't quite so obvious at times. So anybody's welcome to drop, you know, participate in the you know, ask questions, give what they have. I think we should regulate used bookshops. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not your city lights up up there. <laughs> so that would be a quarter to one, and, and so Bob and anybody else who's in those kind of We'll see you at 1.15 or a quarter to one, folks. Hey, thanks for coming. Uh, <laughs>